It's no surprise that some of the most popular characters in the Lord of the Rings are the Nazgul. Well, apart from the Witch King, they are barely characters, more of a force of darkness really, but the point remains. However, this popularity has some ramifications, as the Nazgul became a popular topic amongst the larger fandom and appeared more often in Lord of the Rings related media, they became somewhat misrepresented. So in this video, I'm going to debunk some common misconceptions about the Nazgul. The first misconception is the most petty misconception of them all, because it mostly comes down to a bit of grammar. You may have heard that the Nazgul were nine kings of men, nothing controversial there, right? Wrong. The idea that the Nazgul were nine kings of men comes from Peter Jackson's films. When Aragorn is describing them to the hobbits, he specifically mentions that they were once men, great kings of men. And in the intro to the Fellowship of the Ring, the nine men who would become the Nazgul are all wearing crowns. But nowhere does Tolkien state that the Nazgul were all kings. The closest we get is in the Silmarillion, where it's stated that, those who used the Nine Rings became mighty in their day, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. The way the sentence is phrased suggests that one or some did become kings, but not necessarily all of them. They were also warriors, sorcerers, and perhaps all three at once, like the Witch King. The only other statement that sheds some other light on their origins is in the Akalabeth, where it states that three of them were great lords of Numenorean race. These men, which likely includes the Witch King, were certainly not kings, as they weren't described as such, and there was only one king of Numenor. However, the Witch King later did become a king. But interestingly enough, at Weathertop, of the five Nazgul present, the Witch King is the only one described as wearing a crown. So if the Nazgul were not kings, then what were they? That's the beauty of it. We don't actually know at all. The origin stories for the Nazgul are almost endless. Presumably, some of them might have been already powerful individuals who Sauron ensnared for practical purposes, but some might have just been highly motivated individuals that Sauron saw the potential in. There's nothing that rules out Sauron giving a ring of power to some homeless guy, and then that guy using the ring of power to amass extraordinary power for himself. The ultimate feel-good story. In the case of the Free Numenorean Nazgul, it's likely that they were generals or colonial lords that operated in Middle-earth, which is how Sauron gained access to them. Funnily enough, our second misconception comes from the same movie quote. Only a few seconds later, Aragorn states that the Nazgul are neither living nor dead. This isn't really true either. The Nazgul are alive, there's just a bit of an asterisk next to it. I know, you might be thinking, if they're alive, how come they are called ring wraiths? And I totally get that. In modern fantasy, wraiths are ghosts, undoubtedly a category of undead. But Tolkien's use of wraith is not the same as the modern usage. In layman's terms, in Tolkien's Legendarium, a wraith is a living creature whose body has faded from the physical world into the spirit world. And that's exactly what happened to the Nazgul. They never actually experienced death, the separation of their bodies and spirits. They aren't ghosts or wraiths in the way we understand it. They're men whose bodies have faded into the spirit world, rendering them invisible in the physical world and unable to interact with it unless they are physically cloaked. Now, the reason why I said there's an asterisk is because it could be argued that Aragorn is half right. The Nazgul aren't dead, but they aren't alive in a conventional sense. As far as we know, they don't need to eat, drink, sleep, or even breathe. But my argument against that would be that Aragorn is basically describing a state of undeath. And while the Witch King is once associated with the word undead, it should be noted that that state, as we understand it in modern fantasy, doesn't really exist in Tolkien's universe. The closest we get are Barrowites, but they are corpses that have been possessed by evil spirits, nothing alike the Nazgul. So yeah, the Nazgul are alive because the line between being alive and being dead is quite clear in Tolkien's universe. Have you physically died? No. Then you're alive. If the answer is yes, then you're dead. Unless you've been re-embodied by a higher being or have the ability to re-embody yourself, like Sauron. In the case of the Nazgul, they are men who have found a way to cheat death and have discovered that it has some very horrible consequences. They are alive and are suffering for every moment of it. Speaking of the Nazgul having bodies, this leads me to number three. The Nazgul are bound by the laws of physics. Well, sort of. 
In the Hobbit films, the Nazgul appear as ghostly apparitions that can do all sorts of crazy shit, such as float, fly, and flicker like a broken light. This representation was doubled down on by Shadow of War, where the Nazgul can basically just teleport around and do whatever the hell they want. Do you think it's too late for a video where I talk about all the hilarious shit that the Shadow games did? Anyway, back on topic, there is a problem with the idea of flying teleporting Nazgul. As we just went through, the Nazgul have bodies. Although they have faded into the spirit world, they are not spirits. If they want to get around, they have to get around in the same conventional ways that everyone else gets around. Walk, ride, or the not-so-conventional flight through the use of their fell beasts. Now, you might be thinking, well, hold on, how did the Nazgul get back to Mordor after being washed away at the Fort of Bruinen? The answer, they walked. Shocking, but true. To be fair, it's easy to lose sense of just how much time passes while Frodo was in Rivendell. The Nazgul get washed away on the 20th of October, the Fellowship does not leave until the 25th of December, and the Nazgul are not encountered again until the 23rd of February, when Legolas shoots one down over San Geber. So yeah, it's around four months, and that leaves the Nazgul plenty of time to get back to Mordor, even on foot. Especially when they don't need to eat, and they don't get tired. That's the laws of physics they don't obey. But the idea that the Nazgul can dissipate and simply reform somewhere has inspired another myth, that the Nazgul can't truly be killed and they will simply resurrect when Sauron gives them a new body. We see this in the Hobbit films, where the Nazgul are supposedly killed and buried, and then resurrected. We also see it in Shadow of War, that shouldn't be surprising, but we also see it in more lore accurate depictions. Lord of the Rings Online has the player defeat the Nazgul on multiple occasions, although it's unclear whether the player is actually killing them or is just driving them off. And in Divide and Conquer slash Third Age Total War, the Nazgul have the unique ability of coming back to life a few turns after you kill them. There is, however, precious little evidence that suggests the Nazgul can come back to life. And in actuality, the Nazgul being able to come back to life breaks one of the greatest rules of Tolkien's universe. More on that in a second. Now, to be fair to this theory, Tolkien never debunked it himself, and actually, his use of vague language has helped keep it alive. When the Witch King is killed, it's stated that his cry was never heard again in that age of this world. Some people believe that the cry Frodo and Sam heard after leaving Kirith Ongol was the Witch King's spirit returning to Sauron in anguish. In all likelihood, it was probably just another of the Nazgul delivering news of his defeat. And in a letter, Tolkien says that the Witch King had been rendered impotent, instead of straight up just saying he's dead. The thing is, we don't need to wade into the mess and debunk all the minor details. One of the major concepts of Tolkien's world building is the gift of men, that men inevitably die, pass beyond the boundaries of the world, and only Iluvatar knows where they go, and only Iluvatar can bring them back. It's specifically stated that dead men are beyond the reach of both Sauron and Morgoth. And on top of that, there's no evidence that Sauron can re-embody a slain mortal. Yes, the Nazgul are bound to their rings of power, and ultimately the One Ring, but Sauron does not have direct control over their spirits, he lacks this capability. And whereas the One Ring acts as an anchor for Sauron, it does so because it contains much of his native power, almost like a phylactery. This is not the same for the Nazgul. So if a Nazgul is physically slain, such as the Witch King was, his spirit shouldn't go back to Sauron. It should leave the world and either go to wherever men go, or maybe into the void because the Witch King was a bad dude. Or at least, that's our understanding of it based on how Tolkien's world works. And the Witch King is seemingly aware of this. After all, he places a lot of importance on self-preservation, something that might be absent if he could just continuously keep coming back to life. He flees from Glorfindel after the Battle of Fornost, and again during the Hunt for the Ring. He retreats from Weathertop, partly because he believes that the job is done, but also because he notices that Frodo was wielding a barrow blade, a weapon that could seriously hurt him. And when he confronts Eowyn, he momentarily hesitates when she reveals that she's a woman. That's not the Witch King being chivalrous, that's him remembering Glorfindel's prophecy. Speaking of Glorfindel's prophecy, it would make for a really crappy prophecy if it was fulfilled, and then the Witch King could just come back a few days later. The final misconception is my personal favourite, and by favourite I mean the one I hate the most. 
And I shouldn't, because it's really minor in the grand scheme of things, but hey, we all have irrational pet hatreds. And this pet hatred is about the Barrow Blades. Specifically, it's the idea that the Nazgul are immune to normal weapons, unless they are made vulnerable by a Barrow Blade, a weapon that has been enchanted to hurt them. Interestingly enough, this misconception doesn't have its roots in media portrayal. It's an idea that the fans sort of made up, and then just ran with it. But is it an idea that's true? Well, unfortunately, there's no evidence to suggest that it is. It's never stated that normal weapons cannot hurt the Nazgul. So where did the idea even come from? I'm not certain, but I have an idea. It is mentioned that any weapon that strikes the Witch King will break. When you combine that fact with Glorfindel's prophecy that the Witch King shall not fall by the hand of man, people wrongfully assume that the Witch King was invulnerable. So what removed that invulnerability? The enchanted Barrow Blade, which were designed specifically to counter dark forces out of Angmar. And at the Pelennor Fields, it just so happened that the enchanted blade was used by a hobbit and the killing blow was by a woman, fulfilling Glorfindel's prophecy. But this is actually what is written about the Barrow Blade after the Witch King's destruction. No other blade, not though mightier hands had wielded it, would have dealt that foe a wound so bitter, cleaving the undead flesh, breaking the spell that knit his unseen sinews to his will. There's that mention of undead, by the way. Now it does say that the blade broke a spell, but not a spell of invulnerability, rather the spell that allowed for the Witch King to maintain control over his unseen body. Basically, Merry's dagger paralyzed the Witch King, or at the very least was so painful that it stunned him, which gave Eowyn enough time to stab him in the face with her remarkably normal sword. And in the end, both weapons did perish. Merry's dagger disintegrated and Eowyn's sword exploded spectacularly. But there's no indication that the Witch King would have been able to tank a sword to the head under normal circumstances. He wasn't difficult to kill because of an aura of invulnerability. He was difficult to kill because he rarely put himself in harm's way. And secondly, he was the Witch King. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. And if you believed in any of these misconceptions, I hope you feel bad. I'm joking, of course. Even I get shit wrong all of the time, including everything in this video. That's right, everything in this video was wrong, I made it up. Just joking, only half of it was. And it's up to you to work out which is which. A true Tolkien fan would be able to work it out. Cheers, farewell, and remember, yes, I'm working on a Rings of Power video, yes, it will be out before Season 2, and that's probably all I can promise.